time has run out. Then I'll just have to slow that comet down. You furry coward! There's no way Grayskull can be saved! Masters of the Universe, sometimes referred to as the He-Man series, is a sorcery-themed media franchise created by Mattel. The main premise revolves around the conflict between He-Man, the alter ego of Prince Adam, against a Skeletor on the planet Eternia, with a vast lineup of supporting characters in a hybrid setting of medieval sci-fi technology. In this documentary, we will explore the exciting history of the toy line, while at the same time we will enjoy the complete collection of figures film as it has never been filmed before. This is not only the story of a toy line or a popular cartoon, this is the story of the kids of the 80s. If you grew up in the 80s decade, you know what a glorious time it was. But if you are from a younger generation, you also know that the 80s were awesome. The 1980s were a time of great pop culture, including some of the best movies, music, TV shows and toys of all time. Some may say that the 80s were a golden age for movies because it brought us the best movies and trilogies of all time. Although Star Wars was released in 1977, the trilogy took shape in the 80s with the arrival of the Empire Strikes Back. Steven Spielberg released classics like The Goonies and Indiana Jones. Back to the Future, Ghostbusters and Predator are also just a few examples that round up the decade. With the proliferation of great franchises, music also helped to consolidate this great decade as one of the best. The 80s brought Michael Jackson and Madonna. Also brand new genres like hip hop and the growth of great bands like Metallica happened at that time. Finally, older bands like the Rolling Stones and Queen founded a whole new generation of fans thanks to the video clips. Fashion also stood out in the 80s. The 1980s were a decade of bold colors and striking hairstyles with biker jackets, oversized blazers and small t-shirts. It was certainly one of the most eclectic decades in fashion. The TV shows were also huge during the 80s, and a lot of sitcoms like Growing Pains, Alf and The Wonder Years successfully aired during this decade. But for us, the kids of the 80s, it was all about Saturday morning cartoons. None of us can really forget waking up on Saturday morning, rushing to our TVs to watch our favorite shows. The world of cartoons was a magical place, and it was also a thriving industry for toy companies. Saturday mornings, turn on the fun, excitement, and adventures of all your favorite pals when Pac-Man drops in. These shows of excellent quality, both in animation and a script, contributed to promoting new lines of toys. Despite the fact that most of the cartoons of those years were broadcast in Saturday mornings, Masters of the Universe had a curious novelty. This was the first cartoon in the United States to go straight to syndication and aired on weekday afternoons instead of Saturday mornings. Adam and Orko with Coin Trick, new from the Masters of the Universe collection, each sold separately. Other action figures also sold separately from Mattel. Mm. 
Mattel began developing the Masters of the Universe storyline in the late 1970s, with Conan the Barbarian-inspired concept by Roger Sweet and Mark Taylor. The catalyst for the creation of He-Man began in 1976 when Mattel CEO Ray Wagner declined a request to produce a toy line of action figures based on the characters from the George Lucas film Star Wars, with the film's story rights being acquired by Kenner instead. And finally this evening, if you don't know what a hundred-year-old Wookiee is, he or it is seen here on the left, chances are you're going to find out. Douglas Kiker reports. The film is breaking attendance records all over the country. Not since Jaws have so many people stood in line to see a movie. Star Wars cost $9 million to produce. It will bring in at least 10 times that amount. As a result, the price of 20th Century Fox stock has doubled in the last two weeks. A cowboy movie set in space. That's Star Wars. And it appears this is what just about everybody in the country is in the mood for. Douglas Kiker, NBC News, Washington. And that's it for this evening. We'll be back tomorrow. Until then, good night for NBC News. Kenner Products is introducing 17 new Jedi figures, three new spacecraft. It's spending $12 million to promote... Upon the commercial success of the film trilogy and all related merchandise during the next few years, Mattel attempted to launch several unsuccessful toy lines none of which captured the public's imagination or make a significant dent in the toy industry. Look, Battlestar Galactica all-action toys, evil, non-human, Cylon Centurions with helmet scanners, breastplate pulsators, laser pistols, treacherous enemies of the fleet... To promote the release of the original Battlestar Galactica TV film and series, Mattel produced an entire line based off characters and vehicles from the series that would serve as a competitor to the Kenner Star Wars action figures and Mego Star Trek toys. However, the line did not have the expected success. And from your own colonial diaper launch station, you can attack Cylon targets with special Viper missiles that really fly. Battlestar Galactica, all action toys from Mattel. Roger Sweet, a lead designer working for Mattel preliminary design department throughout much of the 70s and 80s, was the first to conceptualize the idea of He-Man. However, this is not officially acknowledged by Mattel, and authorship of the He-Man character has been subject to debate. According to various former Mattel designers, Roger Sweet drew inspiration for the designs of his first He-Man prototypes from fantasy drawings of Mattel packaging designer Mark Taylor, which included a drawing of a He-Man-like character called Thorak. Royal Sweet presented the He-Man concept to Ray Wagner at the Mattel product conference in the form of three large three-dimensional plaster prototype models, which Sweet dubbed the He-Man Trio. These prototypes were molded from an extensively modified Big G action figure. Battle Cat would also be adapted from a tiger in the Big Jim toy line. The He-Man Trio models were an axe-wielding barbarian a tank-headed soldier, and a spaceman with a Boba Fett-like helmet. Out of the three concepts, the barbarian version of He-Man was chosen to be the basis of the toy line. Roger Street stated that the only way he was going to have a chance to sell this to Wagner was to make three models. He glued a big gym figure into a battle action pose, and he added a lot of clay to his body. Then, he had plaster cast made. These three prototypes, which he presented in late 1980, brought him to existence. This is the Masters of the Universe Mighty Cycle from Tonka. Adult assembly required. It's got bold galactic designs and super sleek styling. Masters of the Universe Mighty Cycle with big, wide track wheels that let you master turns. Master spins. 
Master the action. Masters of the Universe Mighty Cycle. New from Tonka. Originally said under the working title Lords of Power, the name Masters of the Universe came into being when it was suggested that the former name of the toy line was too religious in nature. The roster of characters would soon span the main hero, and Mark Taylor would draw inspiration for the series main villain, Skeletor, from his 1971 sketch entitled The King of Sticks, along with early renderings of his characters Demo Man and Dee Man. Taylor would create preliminary designs for several other original characters as well, with additional ideas of direction from Mark Ellis and Paul Cleveland, among others. But the premise behind the toy line had not yet been fully established. The backstory of Eman was first conceptualized for special mini comic books that would accompany the toys. Mattel had DC Comics mock up a comic book with the earliest storybooks written by Donald F. Glad. With major distributors concerns that five year olds don't read, Mark Ellis then first proposed the idea of an animated TV special. This would eventually lead to a meeting with Filmation head Lou Shamer and the creation of the Masters of the Universe animated series. From the land of Eternia comes the greatest force for good the universe has ever seen. His name is Adam, but by the powers of his magic sword, he's transformed into the most powerful man alive. It's He-Man and the Masters of the Universe, defending all of Eternia from the evil powers of... Skeletor! He-Man moves to weekday mornings at 7, starting Monday on TV40. Earlier in 1980, the right holders of Conan the Barbarian had been negotiating the character toy rights with Mattel and they entered into an agreement the following year regarding characters from the 1982 Conan movie. However, with Mattel introducing the Masters of the Universe toy line in 1982, the rights holders sued Mattel, claiming the character was an infringement on the character of Conan. Mattel eventually won the lawsuit and after legal agreements were dissolved, it was stated that the toy line was never intended for the Conan film. However, some Conan influence can be seen, as Roger Sweet has claimed to have drawn some inspiration from the painting of Frank Fraceta, a fantasy artist with many works depicting Conan the Barbarian. The Masters of the Universe storyline was created by Mattel in 1981 and first released to stores in 1982 as five one half inch action figures as opposed to the size used by Kenner's Star Wars and Hasbro's G.H.O. The two main characters, He-Man, the most powerful man in the universe, and his arch enemy Skeletor, Evil Lord of Destruction, were the first released in action figure form, along with other core characters of the series, Man at Arms, Heroic Master of Weapons, Beast Man, Skeletor's Savage Henchman, and Battle Cat, He-Man's Fighting Tiger. Later on that year, the first wave of action figures in 1982 would also include Tila, Merman, Stratos, and Sodak, the Cosmic Enforcer. The Tila action figure was originally proposed as representing both the Sorcerer's character and the Tila character, as Mattel believed there would not be enough demand for two female action figures in the initial wave. Alongside the first wave of figures were the Battle Ram, the Wind Raider, and the placid Castle Grayskull. Brief descriptions of the characters would appear on the packaging and box art with illustrations by Errol McCarthy, Rudy Obrero, and others. However, as we stated before, the lore of Masters of the Universe would be first fully explored throughout the mini-comics that accompany the action figures throughout the duration of the line, with 49 distinct comics being issued from 1981 until 1987.
These first figures, as well as Cassette Grayskull, were primarily designed by Mark Taylor, although the final production sculpt of the original Human Action figure was completed by Tony Guerrero. Now you can imagine all the power in the universe. The Masters of the Universe collection. 23 pieces, each sold separately. There's He-Man and these heroic action figures. Skeletor and the Warriors of Evil. And four fighting creatures. Castle Grayskull, Point Dread and the Talon Fight. You put them together. And battle machines like the Attack Pack. Batteries not included. What would you do with all the power in the universe? Oh. He-Man, Skeletor, and all other items from the Masters of the Universe collection. Each sold separately. From Mattel. The original form in comics, He-Man and the Power Sword, the King of Castle Grayskull, Battle in the Clouds, and the Vengeance of Skeletor were made by Mattel in 1981 and written by Donald F. Glad, with artwork by Alfredo Alcalá. He-Man is introduced in this first mini-comic as a wandering barbarian leaving behind his jungle tribe on Eternia. The world of Eternia is initially depicted as dealing with the aftermath of a great war that devastated once powerful civilization, leaving behind their fantastical machinery and weapons. The events of the war have also opened a rift between dimensions, which has allowed the evil warlord Skeletor to travel into Eternia. This inaugural incarnation of Skeletor set his sights on obtaining both half of the sword in order to gain entry into the ancient castle. The main premise being that whomever attains control of Grayskull will gain the power to become master of the universe. To combat Skeletor, Himal is given special powers armor and weapons by the sorcerers. Himal, not yet with the dual identity of Prince Adam, is supported in these initial stories by his usual heroic allies and Stratos, who erroneously came fighting on the side of Skeletor in the initial mini-comic. In troubled Eternia, the evil Skeletor stalks his bitter enemy, He-Man, most powerful man in the universe. The power shall be mine! You we'll speak too soon, Skeletor. I have the power. Now the power is yours into mighty new ice treats from streets. Masters of the universe, He-Man and Skeletor, frozen in delicious flavored ice. I will have the power. No, I have the power. Now you have the power. Masters of the universe at your street shop now. The following year, a second wave was introduced, and new figures flooded the toy stores. These early waves of action figures included Himan's allies, along with Skeletor Evil Warriors. The Attack Track Vehicle and Point Red Placer were also released in the 1983 line. The last figure released in this way was Evelyn the evil warrior goddess. She would not be featured in any more media until her prominent role in the Filmation Animated Series.
He-Man, now with a free Adventures cassette. This second series, consisting on seven new mini-comics and released in 1982, was produced by DC Comic, written by Gary Cohn and featured artwork by Mark Teixeira. These mini-comics would devote several issues toward introducing the new action figure characters into the line. He-Man's new ally Ram Man is initially tricked into fighting on the side of Skeletor. Many Faces is introduced as an attorney actor turned into a monster by Skeletor. Skeletor Evil Warriors also get their own introductory mini comics, with Triclops as a skilled swordman and Trapshaw portrayed as a criminal from another dimension. In these pre-filmation stories, most of the primary characters later known in the animation did not yet feature in the series, although the Eternian Palace and the Royal Court of King Randor is featured in several of these mini-comics as well as the mystical Falcon, not yet an alternate form of the Sorceress. The storyline concept of Tila being the secret daughter of sorceress and adopted daughter of Man at Arms was first introduced at this time, as well in the mini comic The Tale of Tila. A special mini comic and record entitled The Power of Point Red was also produced for the Talon Fighter placement. Hello friends, I am He-Man, and I want you to read along as we listen to the adventures of the Masters of the Universe. Get ready for a lot of fun and excitement. Now, let's start. Hidden deep within his mountain lair, Skeletor grins his deadly grin. His newest plot cannot fail. He has planned for everything. Everything that is except the power of Point Dread. Kind of 
In 1983, Masters of the Universe would debut perhaps its most famous incarnation with the animated series He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. Created by Filmation under the direction of executive producer Lou Shamer, the cartoon made its television debut on September 5, 1983, with the episode The Time on Ray of Disappearance. Trying to emulate the Star Wars premiere, in September 24, 1982, Filmation closed down the Hollywood Boulevard in order to debut the Masters of the Universe cartoon at the Man's Chinese Theater. They even put on a show that included a big parade with characters of the animated cartoon. Running throughout two seasons, He-Man and the Masters of the Universe was one of the first animated series produced directly for weekday syndication. Similar to the comics that came before, the series is set on Eternia, which is ruled by King Randor and Queen Marlena, visibly younger in age than their previous comic versions. Their son, Prince Adam, now wearing his more familiar pink vest, pretends to be somewhat lazy, much like his pet tiger, Granger, depicted in the series as being very cowardly and with the ability to speak. Sales of the toy line continue to increase with the exposure of the animated series and new waves of figures and vehicles were produced during this peak of popularity. First introduced into the action figure line in 1984 were the new battle armor versions of Himan and Skeletor, who could be battle damaged when the mechanism on the figure's chest was pressed. These new renditions of He-Man and Skeletor did not appear in the animated series or the mini-comics, but several new characters in the Filmation series found releases in the third and fourth wave of action figures. Making their toy line debut in 1984 were these He-Man allies. Skeletor Civil Warriors received new recruits as well. The major place at that year was a skeletal civil stronghold, Snake Mountain, looking quite unlike the filmation version with the giant ghoulish face molded into plastic and a voice distorting wolf headed microphone. New from the Masters of the Universe collection. Action figures each sold separately from Mattel. Series 3 of Mattel's Moto Mini Comics contains stories similar to the Filmation animated series, with mini comics such as Dragon's Gift adapting stories straight from the first season episodes of the same name. There were some differences from Filmation, however, as can be seen in the Temple of Darkness mini-comic with the sorcerers in an all-white version of the costume.
What happens next? You can find out on the new He-Man Cups at Burger King. There's a different He-Man comic strip cup every week until September 9th when you buy a Burger King meal pack. At Burger King! The Burger King meal pack is filled with a juicy hamburger or cheeseburger, regular fries, and a soft drink. Aren't you hungry? Although at first glance He-Man's animation seems simple, when analyzing it in detail, it's possible to discover that it is a mixed style that makes use of the stock animation system in which shots of characters running, walking, or talking were reused, such as the frame-by-frame -frame animation style is also sometimes used. Masters of the Universe use numerous techniques among which rotoscopy stands out. This 2D animation technique is based on previous filming of real actors to later be used as modern and achieve a fluid animation that is faster to produce. Here we have an example of rotoscopy. In those days, animations were drawn by hand. Then, cells were also painted by hand. Here we have some original cells used during the production of Masters of the Universe. It was possible to reuse them in different scenes, as well as to easily modify them by inserting new frames. As we can see, the animation cells are numbered consecutively and were painted by hand on the back in such a way that the liner remained intact and looked smooth when photographed by the camera. As we can see in these braced out cells, also produced by filmation, this is how the movement is achieved. Now, let's see the final result. Despite the limited animation techniques that were used to produce the series, Masters of the Universe was notable for breaking the boundaries of censorship that had severely restricted the narrative scope of children's TV programming in the 70s. For the first time, a cartoon series could feature a muscular superhero who engaged in on-screen combat, although most of the time wrestling styles move were utilized instead of direct violence. The cartoon was also groundbreaking, and it was produced in connection with marketing a line of toys as advertising directly to children was controversial during this period. 
As an attempt to mitigate the negative publicity generated by these controversies, a life lesson or moral of the story was played at the end of each episode, which was usually tied to the action or central theme of the episode in question. The series, although still popular, would not be renewed for a third season in 1985. I've never known Skeletor to have that much power. The series featured the voice talents of John Irving, who starred as He-Man, the great Alan Oppenheimer, voicing Skeletor, and Linda Gary, as much as the female cast. Orko, I could kiss you. Finally, executive producer Lou Shamer provided the voice work for a multitude of other characters, such as Orko or King Rander. I don't think so, Orko. The series was often produced by Lou Shamer and Hal Sutherland, and directed by Wayne Wetzler and many other talented creators, with Tom Sito serving as a main storyboard artist, along with many other contributors. Writers on the show included Larry DiTilio, David Wise, and also many others including early scriptwriting work from Babylon 5 creator J. Michael Straczynski, Paul Dini of Batman, and one episode by DC Fontana of Star Trek. The 1985 wave of action figures again included new version of He-Man and Skeletor with special action features. Thunder Punch He-Man, whose backpack could be loaded with plastic ring caps to create a loud bang when turning He-Man waste and Dragon Blaster Skeletor, which included a small water scripting dragon chained to a Skeletor's armor. Heroic warriors included in the line were Moss Man, Roboto, and many others. Evil Warriors in 1985 consisted of a Spycor, Too Bad, and a Stinkor. The biggest addition in the 1985 Masters of the Universe storyline came into form of the Evil Horde, whose characters were set to debut in the animated movie The Secret of the Sword. The main villain, Hordak, ruthless leader of the Evil Horde, was followed in action figure form by his evil warriors. Hordak's Lair, The Fright Zone, was also released as a playset in 1985, although it bore no resemblance at all to the industrial looking Fright Zone seen on the animated Shira series. Series 4 of the mini comics in 1985 began to depart from some aspects of Filmation's continuity, as each member of the Evil Hall appeared in their own titular mini comic, focusing more on their attempts to attack Hima and invade Eternia rather than anything Princess of Power related. Likewise, Skeletor's Dragon Blaster and Hima's Thunder Punch powers were never seen in the animated series, but the view in the mini comic Skeletor's Dragon and the treachery of Modulok. Roboto also received an alternate origin story in the Battle of Roboto, being a creation of Man of Arms rather than a wandering alien as in the Filmation series. 
Stinker and Spiker starred in the On Many Comics as well, in The Stench of Evil and Spiker Strikes, which also included Most Man. Only the mini-comic The Ovalis followed the established continuity more closely and did not feature any of the new characters or vehicles. Michael Halperin and Chrissy Marks wrote many of the 1984 and 1985 mini-comics, while Lynn Norderling often served as editor. Larry Houston, Michael Lee and Alfred Alcala composed most of the artworks for these issues, while DC Comics' Bruce Timm was the illustrator for Grizzlor, The Legend Comes Alive. Exhibiting boundless courage, He-Man and Masters of the Universe, along with She-Ra, Princess of Power, dedicated to the pursuit of justice. Join them weekdays at noon on ATV. This rose fights the champion of light. This is the story of one who will become leader of the Great Rebellion. The Shira series began with a five-part animated cartoon, which was later condensed into the animated movie The Secret of the Sword, released theatrically in the spring of 1985 and featuring most of the main characters from both cartoons. The characters would continue to appear in guest role throughout the Shira series as well as a Christmas special. Shira would be revealed as Princess Adora, the long-lost twin sister of Prince Adam, living on Eternia's sister planet of Etheria, ruled by Hordak, the main antagonist of the new series, and the tyrannical leader of the evil Horde. The very last appearance of Filmation's He-Man and Skeletor is in one of the final Shira episodes, entitled Assault on the Hive, airing December 13, 1986. Curiously, Villains in the Princess of Power animated series were produced for the Masters of the Universe line instead of the new upcoming line of toys. In 1985, Mattel and Filmation decided to diversify the Masters of the Universe line beyond its traditional realm of male action in hopes of bringing in a young female audience. The feminine warrior woman heroine, in the same vein as He-Man, was proposed with an all new line of action figures for girls. Released in 1985, Mattel's toy line Princess of Powers featured almost exclusively female characters, all of whom feature an emphasis on hair and clothing, with real hair and partially soft goods costumes. Described as fashion action dolls, essentially the line attempted to fuse the appeal of Masters of the Universe with Mattel's successful line of fashion dolls, Barbie, and added many fantastic clothing accessory packs to complement the female action figures. Filmation Princess of Power first aired on September 9, 1985. The series would run for three seasons, 93 episodes, from 1985 to 1987. Princess of Power was produced in lieu to continue in He-Man and the Masters of the Universe for a third year. However, He-Man often appeared in many episodes to Eddie, his sister, and several other characters from Masters of the Universe, both heroic and evil, also appeared in multiple crossovers. Shira and Adora were voiced in the series by Melendi Breed, and Jordi Senso was the voice of Ohordak and many other characters. Many of the voice actors of the Human series also returned to interpret many of the characters in this cartoon. Princess of Power would air its final episode, Swiftest Baby, on December 5th of 1986 with no real finale for either the Shira or the He-Man Filmation series. The Princess of Power toyline ran from 1985 to 1987, 
for which Mattel would release a total of 22 action figures, with 12 creatures, 2 playsets, and 16 clothing accessories. Shira would also feature in 13 of her own mini-comics, packaged with the figures, along with several children's books, comics, magazines, and read-along record cassette tape books. In those days, the He-Man brand was everywhere. In sneaker commercials, children's candy, and even laundry detergent. Masters of the Universe was mentioned and referred in commercial and movies around the world. <laughs> Qué bárbaro este Gima, está cortando un salamín con la espada del poder. Toy stores fill the windows with action figures and even stage shows and events to promote the line of toys of the moment. Heman's phenomenon was gigantic in the theater, with the power to the show. Tag, you're it. It looks like the fun's over. Oh, but the fun's just begun, Heman. I shan't give you the pleasure. The masters of the universe. Power Tour. The He-Man and She-Ra. Meet the forces of Skeletor and Horda. Will the curtain prevail? See the exciting Jeff Cake competition. See the spectacular Eternium Circus. Theatrical celebration. Opening live at Radio City Music Hall, February 12. The Masters of the Universe. <laughs> Masters of the Universe, the motion picture, was released theatrically in the United States on August 7, 1987. Although in those years this was not a great success, today it is regarded as a classic cult film. The final series of action figures and mini comics in 1986 and 1987 would continue the adventures past the animated series and its sequel in a sheer all line introducing new characters not seen in the cartoon series such as Rio Blast, Extender and many others. Other later Motu characters saw release in the form of the elephant-headed Snout Spout and the Rock Warriors, Rockon and Stone Dog.
Finally, the Snake Men were released, as well as a new version of the lead characters, Hemon, Skeleton and Hordek. This is Adora, He-Man's twin sister. The day she raised aloft her sword, Adora became She-Ra, princess of power, the most powerful woman in the universe. This is wicked Katra, feline foe of She-Ra. Katra uses her evil powers to try and take over Ethereum. Katra's steed is headstrong Storm. Shira and Katra. You from Mattel. During those years, the success of Masters of the Universe was enormous, so huge that many competitors tried to emulate it with varying degrees of success. The reason was that Mattel had not only created a fabulous toy line, it had created a new style of toy, the Motu action figure style. These new action figures were made by tons of different companies around the world in a wide range of quality. Some of them were just copycat figures designed to look like Masters of the Universe figures, like the Warrior Beast or the Galaxy Warriors. But others were based on new stories or pre-existing content, such as the Lost World of the Warlord figures that were based on DC Comics. In this last group of toys, we can place the beautiful Black Star action figure line. Black Star was an animated television series produced in 1981 by Lou Shamer and Norm Prescott for Filmation. This cartoon tells the story of John Black Star, an astronaut stranded on the planet Sega after his spacecraft was swept into a black hole. This science fantasy show has many notable similarities to the Masters of the Universe, which was produced shortly afterward, also by Filmation. But beyond those similarities, what is relevant to the subject at hand is that in 1983, the Galoob Toy Company launched a spectacular line of toys based on the Black Star animation. Figures were packaged with a Trobit or Demon, as well as individually. Trobits were also individually packaged, and there was also a fourth pack gift set released. The second series was mostly a re-release of the first, with a new laser light feature.
The quality and variety of these figures is for sure part of the legacy of the Masters of the Universe storyline that continues to this day, with toy companies around the world producing action figures in the fabulous Mojo style. The first series of Masters of the Universe line consisted of eight figures. On the back of the card, it is possible to see the drawings of these eight figures. For this reason, fans of the line often refer to them as the eight-pack figures. Today, they are the most sought after by the collectors around the world. As a major proponent of the 80s action figure boom, Masters of the Universe proved to be very popular and were produced and marketed all over the world. At a less expensive price point, several accessory packs of smaller weapons, including the Mega Laser and Shell Sled, accompanied by several small transforming egg-shaped creatures known as the Meteors, came into the line in 1987. Most of action figures were made in Taiwan and Malaysia. However, Mattel also had production facilities in Mexico, various countries of Europe like Spain, France and Italy, and joint ventures with Leo Toys of India, Top Toys of Argentina, Estrella of Brazil, Rotoplast of Venezuela and Takara of Japan. Additional waves of action figures and vehicles were released every year until 1987, totaling 70 distinct figures in all, with the final overseas release from the original line coming from Italy in 1988. Super action toy for every kid 4 to 11 with paid admission. Meet them all and get a free toy. Now through January 5th, live at Universal. Just as there are myths and legends in the history of Masters of the Universe, the toy line is also riddled with them. Such is the case of the famous Wonder Bread He-Man, that for a long time it was thought that it had to do with the promotion of the well-known bread for sandwiches. But some people claim that there is evidence that it would simply be a failed promotion of Mattel. Another rare case is that of the Cobra Can Camuflado, or Camo Can a repaint of the original figure but with different arms and legs. It was manufactured by Top Toys, the company licensee of Mattel in Argentina. As one of its owners explained a few years ago, this new character was created in order to use an excess of stock. Another interesting figure is Chiger. This is an unreleased character from the Masters of the Universe storyline, who would eventually have a figure released as part of the Masters of the Universe classic. The unreleased vintage figure was meant to be a reuse of the Big Jean Gorilla mold. Finally, we also found six figures that, although were in the plans, were not made. This collection of unproduced characters appeared on some Errol McCarthy cards. Here we have a heroic ninja similar to Ninja. In this photograph we can find a warrior with the head of Thisto and the armor of Hero. And here we have Strobo, whose only appearance was in the Masters of the Universe story, the dark power of Skeletor. Apparently there were some evil warriors like the serpent called Soldiers. Here we have a snake man with clawful pincer and the scarecrow cape. 
here we have another snake man with trap jaws mechanical arm and whiplash's head. Possibly this wave was planned to sail together with Hiro and Eldor at the same time. Finally, we cannot forget the enormous Turbosaurus, also known as Gigantosaurus. This creature was the only dinosaur show in the 1987 Mattel catalog that was not produced. With the advent of the Transformers, in 1985, Mattel had planned to release the character known as the Evil Robot. This figure, which appeared in the catalogue, seemed to be based on a Japanese toy design like the Meteors. Unfortunately, it was never produced. We also find the Hot Mummy, a concept character that was not produced back in the day, but it was released under the Masters of the Universe classic line by the name Rat Trap. Finally, it's worth mentioning that in 1986, Mattel held a character contest in which fans were asked to create a new character. The winning character would become an official action figure. The character never got into toy production until in 2012. It was also included in the 30th anniversary series of Mario Classics. These are just some of the many myths and legends that remain to be discovered in the Himan's amazing figure line. Introducing the first Masters of the Universe home video game. Also led into the line in 1987 were three original characters from the live action movie Blade, the evil master of swords, Sauron, evil spark shooting reptile, and Wilbur, heroic creator of the cosmic key. With the entry into the modern mythos explaining one of the last original mini comics, none other movie related figures were produced. However, in 1988, the final action figures of the original toy line the laser-powered versions of He-Man and Skeletor did bear some resemblance to their live-action movie counterparts and were released only to European markets. One of the main storylines of the later mini-comics released with these later action figures was the introduction of a new major villain faction known as the Snake Men. First appearing in the mini-comic King of the Snake Men, these evil warriors were now under the leadership of the Asian King Hiss, whose Snake Men came to Eternia, joining forces with Skeletor to once again rule Eternia. Another major mini-comic storyline from this period included the introduction of the Three Towered Fortress of Eternia and the Ultimate Battleground, which was a massive final place for Motu, one of the biggest of all 80 storylines, complete with a motorized monorail circling the towers. This storyline was leading toward what would have been a continuation of the series in the power of Grayscale Line before being discontinued. He-Man in a time warp. Where? Ancient pre-Eternia, lost land of the dinosaurs. Thunderous Tyrannosaurus Rex battles mighty Bionotops, ferocious dinosaurs. Take this, man. How 
how can He-Man survive? New from the Masters of the Universe, figures Bionatos, Tyrannosaurus Rex, and Turbo Gacto each so something. The proposed storyline was to focus on ancient Eternia, which was populated by many creatures, including cybernetic dinosaurs and giants. When the sorcerers and He-Man arrive followed by a Skeletor, they find King Hills leading an attack on a village in hope of drawing out the elders using some of the cybernetic dinosaurs to their advantage. King Hills serves on a strange being and agrees to unite with the Skeletor on the basis that he may be an emissary. Seeing a Skeletor interference, the sorcerers allow Heman to enter the battle, but he had to be disguised. He finds himself overwhelmed, but then a shadowy figure appears who turns the odds with a powerful wand. The strangers send the Snakemen back to their base and all the time travelers home. The sorcerer describes the intervener as the greatest wizard of all, and Heman is left asking, but who is he? No further story information is given, and it remains unclear how the giants mentioned and released as toys would fit into the story. However, some marketing press releases and prototypes have shed further information in this. The wizard was to be Hero, an ancestor of He-Man, raised by his mentor Eldor and discovering special powers in a cave. Hero would have led the fight against the Stangman. According to the minicomics writers, it was intended that the central antagonist would be Keldor, a character revealed similarly late in a line to have been Himan's uncle and also strongly hinted to have been the former identity of Skeletor. Unfortunately, these stories that never appear in the minicomics are not entirely clear, and the canon of Masters of the Universe from this point becomes increasingly cloudy. It will depend on the will of the fandom to believe or not believe these stories that were told after the release of the original figures of the 80s. See Masters of the Universe in a Viewmaster viewer. Know how we make it look so real? Viewmaster 3D artists draw lots of pictures. See, one in the back, one in the middle, and one in the front. When you see them all together in 3D, the characters look so real, you think you could reach in and touch them. With Viewmaster, you can collect lots of program reels on cards and in gift sets, like Smurf and Shirt Tales, each sold separately. Viewmaster gift set with 3D Viewer and a Masters of the Universe adventure on three reels. In 1990, a couple of years after the ending of the original Masters of the Universe product line, a second He-Man animated series titled The New Adventures of He-Man was created by Jet Lag Productions. The new series was radically different from the original fantasy-oriented one, shifting to an almost purely science fiction setting that sees He-Man transported to the futuristic planet of Primus. Neither the New Adventures animated series or toy line proved nearly as popular as the originals, and the line ended with little fanfare in 1992. Sticker, free and special packs of shreddies. Many years later, in 2002, a new animated series was released by Mike Young Productions, and an awesome action figure line was produced. This series involved much tighter continuity and somewhat greater depth of characterization than its filmation predecessor. 
but despite having an exceptional animation and quite interesting scripts, it did not have the expected success and it was cancelled before its third season in 2004. Later, in 28, Masters of the Universe Classics came sculpted by the Force Horsemen. These toys were updated versions of previous figures and surpassed the original 80s toy line in terms of length running continuously for 7 years with more than 150 figures produced. In 2016, the production company Super 7 obtained the Masters of the Universe license and produced several figures in different shapes and forms. The most notables were those Filmation-style versions of the vintage figures, along with unreleased figures such as Hero and Eldor. Finally, Mattel began producing Masters of the Universe action figures once again in 2019, and the new animations of Shira and Himan on Netflix brings us new and exciting toy versions of our characters of yesteryear. Fortunately, the magic of Himan's toys lives on to this day. A lot of things from the 80s still hold up, and Masters of the Universe is one of them. With an iconic heritage of memorable mythology dating back to 1982, this incredible franchise continues to inspire generations of kids and will certainly live forever in the hearts of those 80s kids coming home from school, stumbling throughout the house, to sit in front of the TV, just to say.